Hello students, welcome to class. Today we are in India at a very famous temple. This is the Jagannath temple in a state called Orissa. And we're gonna be learning about temples and we're gonna be meeting uh, some more gods in this week and some goddesses next week. And I hope you feel the love because this week we're also gonna be learning about love, love in Hinduism. And the term for love is called bhakti. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started here. All right, and it's recalling we are here in the part of the world that we're studying is called South Asia. And we're continuing with Hinduism. In Hinduism, we've met two major social groups so far. We've met the family as a social unit, and we've been meeting also the renouncers, those who are giving up the family life, those who will seek other relationships. For example, and this is something you may want to know, and it's very important to note, the renouncers, the most important relationship as found in the Upanishads and found among many, many groups is the guru disciple or teacher student relationship. That is the foundational relationship of the renouncer traditions. So you want, they want to note that. All right, so we have the renouncer traditions and we have the householders, seemingly different worlds. But we're going to learn today a little bit about a text. This is called the Bhagavad Gita. This is what some, some would call like the Hindu Bibles. Arguably the most popular Hindu scripture today. And this is a scripture that shows a path to moksha. Remember, moksha is the release from the samsara, the cycle of birth and death. And the Gita promises both, it brings together both the path of the renouncer and the path of the householder into one into one system. All right, we're going to see today: Is there one God in Hinduism? There are many gods and goddesses. The answer is kind of, sort of both. Hinduism has polytheistic tendencies, monotheistic tendencies, pantheistic, meaning that everything is part of you know, the divine. This here is Ganesh, the remover of obstacles, the Lord of beginnings. Around the fifth century BCE, smaller kingdoms start transforming into empires. And at the center of an empire, an imperial city will be the imperial temple housing the major god or goddess belonging to the emperor and em or empress. There are two main parts to a temple. We have first, think of divine things that you find in nature, like trees and rivers. Well, what might this look like? These resemble mountaintops. So temples typically have a shikara resembling a mountaintop. The other is at the center of the temple is a divine image. And this is called the murti. And another important term we want to remember, this will be the house of the god or gods or god and goddesses inside the temple and the most important part of the murti is the temp is the eyes and we're going to learn more about that when we get into puja shortly so hindu temples home of imperial high gods so as small kingdoms become em empires the empires have a major temple that the emperor will sponsor and the god or goddess becomes the protector of the kingdom the empire there is a source of both royal and divine power. So the, just as the king is the center of the empire, the king or queen's temple is the center of the divine universe. 
significant economic impacts. Many of these major temples were sites of pilgrimage and pilgrims would come, they would make offerings, they would buy goods and commodities in the city and city, cities that had major temples often became very, very rich off of pilgrimage. With the rise of the temples, we're gonna see a new form of worship. We've seen worship in the form of sacrifices. We've seen worship in the form of seeking the divine within. Here, we're gonna see this idea of worshiping a divine image. And there's two, there's two theories of the murti, a divine image. One is that the image is just a representation of the divine, a symbol. The other is that the divine actually enters in to the, the statue and to the image through the act of worship or puja. And puja is the most common ritual, the most common practice found in Hinduism. Important to note that. Broadly speaking, when we think of God in Hinduism, we have two concepts. We have this idea of a formless God, Nirguna, and a God with form. So Nirguna is God without form, called Brahman in the Upanishads. This is the absolute reality. And then we have the Saguna Brahman, the God with form and attributes. Some examples of this might be Shiva or Vishnu, which we're gonna learn more about today, the goddesses, Ganesh. This is a monkey figure, Hanuman. And this is a guru, Sai Baba. It is the God with form, Saguna Brahman, that is at the center of the temples. Well, without further ado, let's go visit a temple. All right, and this is the Hindu temple. Let's take a look. Hindu temples can be seen throughout the villages, towns, and cities of India. A temple can be a simple structure by the side of the road or an entire complex of buildings. Regardless of its size, the Hindu temple is essentially a dwelling place for the gods. A principal deity resides at the heart of each temple, like a king or queen in their palace. Other deities, attendants and mythical figures can also be seen as part of the temple structure. Surrounding the temple are stalls selling offerings and souvenirs such as fruit, flowers, sweets, and postcards. The atmosphere around the temple is lively and boisterous. The interior of a Hindu temple is not designed to hold large congregations. Worshippers come and go in small groups through a hallway leading to an inner sanctuary. Here, the image or symbol of the main deity is located. In an active temple, statues of the deities are covered with garlands and draped with rich fabrics. Above the sanctuary rises a central tower, often brightly painted. The shape of the tower resembles the mythical mountain home of the gods. Other features of temples include sacred bathing ponds, walled enclosures, 
and gateways in a variety of shapes and sizes. Here at Madurai in southern India, the gateways tower above the temple complex and are covered with statues. Some temples are no longer in active use. At Khajuraho in central India, tourists now flock to see celebrated images of gods and loving couples adorning the exterior walls. In Konarak, near the eastern coast, are the remains of one of the largest temples ever built in India. It was dedicated to the sun god Surya. The original tower no longer survives, and we can only imagine its size from the smaller buildings that still stand. The immense variety of temples throughout India is the result of local styles and preferences and centuries of architectural developments, each attest to the artistry of countless masons and sculptors. The sculptures of deities seen in the Asian Art Museum were once part of an active Hindu temple. They adorned the exterior walls, interior spaces, entranceways, high wall niches, and inner sanctuaries. Okay, so that was a little bit of a tour of a Hindu temple. And as a few things to be noted, the Design can vary from region to region. There is, so, so for example, in South India, the style and architecture might be very, very different than, say, North India. Let's return back to the point I raised earlier. We, were, we learned last week of this idea of a universal God, a universal essence to everything, the spirit of the universe called Brahman. And each one of us is a part of it. Our real self, the nature of who we truly are, is the Atman, a divine self, a divine being that's part of Brahman. Well, Brahman, this idea of Brahman without form, Nirguna means without form, it's, it didn't, wasn't as appealing to an, to an idea that emerged around, around the age of the, the, the imperial cities, and that's Saguna, the idea of a god or goddess with form. Brahman having an actual form that you can see, that you can encounter. And in Hindu belief, this form can also see and can see you and bless you through the power of the eyes, the concept of darshan or darshana. In this context, where we have an idea of a god or goddess with form, the Saguna Brahman, a new idea will emerge. We learned yoga means to yoke, to unite. Bhakti is love. The idea of obtaining moksha or liberation from samsara, the cycles of birth and death, through love. So let's talk about bhakti yoga. Bhakti is love and devotion to a deity or more than one deity. Bhakti yoga is this ideal that the individual and the god or goddess will come into an eternal loving union. Yoga, again, is to unite, to yoke. Moksha, in the context of bhakti, is an eternal state of loving union with the god, with Brahman, particularly Saguna Brahman, god with form. Bhakti becomes a path accessible to women 
and lower caste groups. And this is another really key point to note. Whereas with the Vedic recitation, we saw a select few who could drink the soma, participate in the rituals, particularly those of the highest castes. Women in low caste groups didn't really have much of a part to play, as many of you had observed in the Vedic ritual video. Bhakti, the path of loving and being loved by the divine, this becomes accessible to everyone. So how do you show love for God? The most common way is by chanting the name of a divine being. It could be the god Krishna. It could be the god, one of the goddesses like Sarasvati or Lakshmi. It could be Ganesh, our elephant-headed deity. By chanting the names of these deities with love, the power of the name brings the devotee closer to their object of devotion. And that again is the being that we are, the, the divine that we are loving, whether it's in the form of Ganesh or Shiva or Vishnu, or one of the many forms that the divine can take in Hinduism. Poetry. With the rise of the temple cities and the idea, the rise of loving God, we'll see a new age of poetry and poetics. Much of the literature much of the poetry, much of the art throughout the whole history of human civilizations has been linked to religion. Dance. Dance also has its history and origins, often as a form of prayer, as a form of devotion in the context of bhakti. And the most common form of ritual, the most popular practice of Hinduism, which is puja, worshiping the god and goddess in the form of an image vis-a-vis -vis making offerings. There's also pilgrimage to places that are associated with the gods and goddesses, great festivals in their honor. So how do Hindus learn about their gods and goddesses? Let's just talk a little bit about that. This is really cool goddess. This is Kali. We'll learn more about her next week. Through ancient stories called the Puranas. The Puranas are a new set of Hindu scriptures that emerge with these new forms of the divine that are arising with the temple cities. And what do we see here in this picture? We see an image of the Milky Way. The Puranas understand the universe as going through cycles of creation, preservation, and destruction. This is similar, this is akin to the human life. The human life is born, it has a lifespan, then it dies. The universe operates in the same way. The same order that we see in the individual life, that also takes place in the universe. In the universe, there are three main gods who are going to be associated with this process. When it's time for the, a universe to come into creation, for a world to be born or reborn, you have the god Brahma. During the natural lifespan of a universe, the god Vishnu. Vishnu is the preserver and protector. Vishnu will preserve and protect the universe and all of its inhabitants, including us, so long as it is within the natural lifespan of the universe. And then finally, in the end, we have the god Shiva, who is the cosmic destroyer, who will bring an end to the universe when its lifespan has ended. This is called the Trimurthy, the three faces of the universe. Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the cosmic destroyer. Today, we're going to focus on the god Vishnu. And with Vishnu, we're going to get the Hindu concept of the avatar. Some of you might have heard this term avatar from the, the film 
was it? That's the film, the, the, the animated series, which I just started watching on, on Netflix called Avatar, The Last Airbender. The Avatar in Hinduism. Vishnu will come down into the universe as a divine hero. This is whenever the universe is in danger of dying out before its lifespan. Vishnu will come down kind of like a light ray from the sun. And the Bhagavad Gita says, whenever sacred duty decays and chaos prevails, then I create myself to protect men of virtue and destroy men who do evil. To set the standard of sacred duty, I appear in age after age. So whenever the universe, whenever that which upholds the universe, the Dharma is in decline, Vishnu will come down into some kind of form as an epic hero. And there's many great stories and epic poems about Vishnu coming down and protecting the universe from storms, from evil kings, from demons. Here is one of the forms of, one of the avatars of Vishnu. This is Nadha Simha. A demon was granted a special power that neither an animal nor a god nor a human could kill the demon. And the demon could not be killed inside or outside. So Vishnu being the crafty figure that he is, well, he can't be killed by an animal or human, but what about a hybrid of the two? So Vishnu comes down as a man lion and not as Simha and lures the demon to a place that's neither inside nor outside. Where is a place that's neither inside nor outside? In the doorway. Vishnu will slay this evil demon in the doorway. Rama, this is an epic king. A uh, very popular story in Hinduism is called the Ramayana or the Ramayana. This is a god king who Vishnu comes down and he battles an evil, evil villain named Ravana who kidnapped his wife, Sita, who is, is a goddess. Rama's wife, Sita, is a very popular goddess in Hinduism. And perhaps the most popular avatar is Krishna. Krishna is very popular in terms of devotion. There's many, many devotees of Vishnu in the form of Krishna. And Krishna has the form of cow. cow. So this, this is Vishnu. This is Krishna as an adult. And this is Gopal or baby Krishna. All right. And let's kind of go skip ahead a little bit here. Oh. Sorry, a little technical difficulties. Let's take a look at a popular story involving Krishna. This is baby Krishna as Gopal or Gopala. One day, baby Krishna was eating dirt. At least baby Krishna's brother thought he was eating dirt. And Krishna's mom comes to the avatar, to the divine incarnation, and says, let me see what's inside your mouth. Let me see that you've been eating dirt. And Krishna's like, I haven't been eating dirt. Well, then let me, let me look, look inside your mouth. That was the response by the mother. And, and the mother looks inside the mouth of baby Krishna. And what, what does, what does she see? Well, let's take a look at what she sees. So again, Vishnu is an avatar, a divine incarnation. And let's take a look at the story of what happens as this divine incarnation's mom looks inside his mouth. What does she see? Huh? Are you crazy? You get sick eating dirt. No, don't swallow it. Spit it out. Oh, no, 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 no. Our mother.
Petals will be angry that I let you eat dirt. Uh, it's not my fault. What's not your fault? If Krishna gets sick, I told him not to eat it. Eat what? Dirt. Is this true? Did you eat dirt? He's lying. Look in his mouth. My dear little Krishna, can't you see how worried your brother is? Why have you eaten dirt? Mm -mm. Are you sure he ate dirt, Balram? Yes. There is only one way to know for sure. Krishna, if you are telling the truth, then just open your mouth and I shall see. I, I, I must be dreaming. Uh, you sure that? She saw something inside Krishna's mouth. I saw the entire universe. All right. So what does Krishna's mom see when she looks inside his mouth? She sees the entire universe. And that's because her son is not an ordinary son. He is a divine incarnation of Vishnu, an avatar. All right, so that's the god Krishna, and Krishna is also associated with the Bhagavad Gita, one of the most popular, what has become akin, some call it the Bible of Hinduism today. The Bhagavad Gita is a text that will perhaps, more so than any other text, create a, a comprehensive vision of what is modern day Hinduism that's Krishna will explain to his disciple Arjuna the four major paths or methods for uniting with God. These four paths are the four major paths that comprise of Hinduism today. What are these four paths? So like just as multiple rivers can flow into the ocean, it's said that there's multiple ways of getting to the divine, whether one calls that divine Brahman or Vishnu or Shiva. The Bhagavad Gita, the Holy Scripture, articulates four major paths. These are the path of uniting via karma yoga. This means selfless action. And what does it mean to be selfless action? It means that one will do their duty but not be attached to the results. So if you're a student, you're taking an exam, you take that exam because it's your duty, but you're not attached to the results. So acting in a way in the world in which we are not anticipating and attached to results, this can be a pathway. Some modern day Hindus have said, engaging in humanitarian work, like feeding the poor or curing the sick, this could be an example also of uniting with God via karma yoga. The other is bhakti yoga, the path of loving devotion, arriving at moksha, the state of liberation from samsara via the power of loving the divine. Jnana yoga is the path of wisdom. This is using the power of one's intellect, and this is arriving at usually. Nirguna Brahman, God without form, whereas Bhakti is Saguna, God with form. Raja Yoga is a path of meditation. This will include some of the practices of Hatha Yoga and various other yogic traditions using energy points in the body, chakra. Often Raja Yoga and Jnana Yoga are closely connected whereas bhakti and karma are often very closely connected to each other. And one can, can 
practice traditions from all four of these paths. It's quite common in modern day Hinduism. Now we're gonna look at the most common ritual, the most common practice found in Hinduism, and that is puja. Let's take a look at an example of a puja. So we're gonna look at an example of the most common practice that we find in Hinduism, the practice of puja. Let's get out of this here. The suns, the planets, All right, ocean. So Krishna mom, she saw the whole universe. Now let's go into the world of puja. <laughs> saw a little bit of a puja being done and let's take a look a little a little bit more closely at the different parts of the puja which is again it's the most common ritual found in hinduism puja is the worship and rituals dedicated to a god or goddess typically manifest within an image an actual picture a statue but sometimes a natural object like a river or a rock or a tree, it mirrors, and this is the most important thing, it mirrors the host guest relationship. During puja, the god or goddess is being invited down as the guest of honor. 
the worshiper is the host offering the special guest food, sweet smelling incense, flower, light, fire. This fire is called arti. So the host guest relationship is the foundation of how worship is performed via puja. And it's not just any guest, this is hosting a royal guest. Royalty and divinity are very closely linked in Hinduism. So you're, you're, you're hosting a royal guest. This is again another popular tradition that cuts across class, caste, class, and gender. If one were to really ask me, well, if there's one thing I can say that most Hindus do, what do most, but not all, not all, what would probably be the most common thing that Hindus do? It's puja. It is, and a puja, again, the most important thing to understand the, the rituals and performances mirror a host guest relationship where the god or goddess is brought down as the divine royal guest of honor. This is ubiquitous, this means it's found everywhere. It's performed in temples, homes, sacred spaces, daily or during sacred times. So this could be the morning, the evening, or during special festivals. Most practicing Hindus perform puja twice a day, and one should perform puja, perform puja daily and twice a day. Puja should only be done after a shower or bath, so bathing is very important. And it's recommended that it's done before breakfast. The main purpose is to make the god or goddess feel like a welcomed royal guest, to feed the god or goddess so food offerings are made. And then there is a receiving of blessed food. The blessed food is the food that's offered. Those the, after the food is offered to the god or goddess, the, the, those who are performing the puja will then eat the food or the milk, the sacred, the sacred foods and beverages. The most important, perhaps, culmination of this whole ceremony is this co concept of darshan or darshana, seeing and being seen. So here, Whenever you look at a murti, and this is another thing to note, in, a, in, in an image of the divine, the most common feature are the eyes. According to Indic ideas of sight, seeing is touching. If someone looks at you, they're, they're touching you. So that's why if someone gives you like a really mean look or they're staring at you, you can kind of sense it. Well, here, the god and the goddess, and this here it's Krishna and Krishna's consort or wife, Radha. Puja is done to welcome them into the actual physical statues. They are offered food, they're offered light, songs, praise. Then the happy guests, which are the god and goddess, return all the blessings in the form of their loving sight. They look onto their devotees with a loving gaze. And that by looking at the devotees, they are touching the, the individuals who are performing the puja. This is very, very important aspect is during a puja, Hindus will want to come, they'll want to see the eyes of the murti, the divine image, because to see is to also be seen. And by looking into the eyes of the divine, the divine looks into you and you then touch each other. And this darshan, darshana is a great, mighty form of blessing. So again, murti is a divine image made manifest in the world. The eyes are the most important part of the murti. Arthi is an offering of light, and we can think of fire going all the way back to the ancient Indo-Aryans and the god Agni. So fire and light is offered. And the culmination of everything is the most important aspect of the Murti. One will be seen by the god and goddess who has been very happy to have been invited and welcomed as a royal guest that seeing 
becomes a form of divine touch. One is then touched via the sights. Okay, so today we've, in today's lectures, we've gone over the path of bhakti, of loving devotion. We've learned that this concept of eternal soul pervading the universe, this one essence of everything, this one Brahman, Hinduism would come over time to divide this concept into two. Brahman without form, Nirguna, this is the form of Brahman we saw last week in the Upanishads, then Saguna, which can manifest with form as gods and goddesses. It is the saguna form that's the object of bhakti and loving devotion. The most common way to show love and devotion is through puja. And the puja mirrors a relationship of host and guest where one is hosting the divine as the guest of honor. The divine guest returns all the blessings and returns love in the form of darshan, darshana, seeing and touching those who are making the offerings, those who are performing the puja. The path of bhakti, the path of puja, the practice of puja will, will cut across caste, gender, and other social divisions in Ancient, in ancient and contemporary Indian society. All right, well, that concludes today's lecture. Um, as always, stay safe, stay well, and stay tuned.